Hi, good evening to everybody. Thank you for joining me. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. And today I'm doing a little bit of a history reflection. And I'm talking about thalidomide. And what I'll be looking at in a short period of time is that I'm looking at an interesting article from MDDUS, which is a, a medical defense union, union about saving Marilyn and the thalidomide cautionary tale. I'll also be making reference to a paper here about thalidomide um, by Dr. Lasagna, and it's important his name, which I'll come back to because of his influence with regards to the thalidomide situation that existed in the USA and how the USA got protected. But I am focused primarily on this because I think that this was an issue about greed rather than regulations. I mean, regulations were a part of it, but I really think this was fundamentally greed. And if greed existed then, it exists today. So can we truly say never again? That's really the question and my reflection on the topic. Before I start, just a quick update starting just in uh, another day, if you're watching it uh, live here today, is Advanced COVID 360 um, Part 2, which will be recorded. Um, if you want to join me on the recording, it's a small group recording. So um, you, if you have questions, I'll be able to answer them. And then this will become part of the Advanced COVID-360 course, which is still on at a discount until this part is uploaded. So if you want to hear the full bit and then join the course, it's up to you. But use the links below. And that's the update for today. There are a few more links in the description, and I'll let you take a look at them. So back to this history reflection. It's important to note that very often history repeats itself. And the mistakes that were made in the past, if you don't carefully analyze them, you will then miss the essence of what is being taught. And in the context of thalidomide, I think that this is a very important topic because when I pull back from it and I do my reflection on it, this was primarily about commercial greed more than anything else. And so I'm going to take you through this article and then I'll be, as I said, making a few thoughts about it uh, towards the end. This is Saving Marilyn. And this was done in 2013. You can see here 2013. And it's making the, the story that in 1962, Marilyn Monroe was dead in the bedroom of her house because of our barbiturate overdose, barbiturate poisoning. And so they were using barbiturates, which are very powerful anti-epileptics, was being used at that time as a sedative and sleeping pill. But there was a toxicity problem. And they were struggling to find a safer but still effective sedative that could replace it. The drug that seemed to come in that bill was this drug produced by a German company in the 1950s. It was originally developed as an anticonvulsant, but it had sedative properties. And critically, the apparent safety of the drug was striking. This drug was thalidomide, and it was launched in West Germany in 1957 as an over-the-counter sedative. I want you to pause there a little bit and just think about something. In effect, they'd broken into a market there. They needed an over-the-counter safe sedative, and this drug seemed to fit the bill. And you would think that they would be happy with that, because suddenly now you can promote this drug as a sedative, over the counter, you can get to a large group of people, but they made a big mistake. And if you look carefully as what happens next, here you have, as I said, it was launched. More than 40 other countries followed, including the UK, where thalidomide was launched in April 1958 as distival. However, look at this. As the drug also reduced nausea 
it became a popular sleeping tablet amongst pregnant women suffering from morning sickness. Interestingly, the first victim was thought to have been an employee of the company who gave his wife, his pregnant wife, the drug. But it took another five years before the link between the deformities and the drug would be made. Now, I want you to think carefully here. They had a big market to reach. Lots of people had sleeping problems, men, women. Why in the world did they step into the area of pregnancy? It was just an unnecessary risk. Maybe at that time they'd never had any issues in pregnancy, and so therefore they perceived that pregnancy would therefore be a very safe or not an issue compared to other things. Why am I talking about thalidomide now? Okay. When we think about the pandemic, one of the things that I cannot get my head around is that we knew who was high risk. We knew the population, so much so that that high risk population was targeted right at the beginning. They were the first to be inoculated. Then suddenly there was a change of plan. And suddenly everybody thought, whoa, why don't we use this to stop the pandemic? I mean, what was that? That was not science. That could only have been greed because it was unnecessary. You knew the low risk cohort. I mean, at the moment, their children, six months, I mean, in the beginning of the pandemic, nobody was worried about children because they so rarely got sick. I mean, when I looked at the data coming out of Israel at one point, it was something like three in a million, of which none died, it just, just got hospitalized. It was incredibly low numbers. Why take the risk? It really is, it, it baffles me. So let's get back to then what happened afterwards. This is the lesson here. So interestingly, in 1960, this drug reached in front of Francis Kelsey in the US, in Washington, DC. She was a doctor, physician, and pharmacologist. She was appointed as a medical officer and reviewer at the FDA. And they thought they were giving her an easy one to start with. But this lady was very detailed. She was very thorough in what she did. And she saw some issues with the drug. And so she raised them. And you can see here that there was an American drug company, Richardson Merrill. Um, they were acting on behalf of the primary um, German company. And their plan was to flood the American market once they had passed the formalities. Kelsey, however, was very rigorous and meticulous in detail, and she did not roll over. This is the bit now where we are coming to the part that I think is very relevant. So they were struggling to convince Kelsey that there was no issue here. So they, they thought this would have been a straightforward thing, you know, just, you know, the drug is used in Europe, bring it across here into the US, flood the market with it. It should be easy peasy. And that was what other regulators thought as well. But this lady was quite determined to be thorough. And here is the bit that I think is very, very important. So she then threw out the application on day 58, Kelsey threw out the application, presenting Merrill with their first rejection in a battle that would then go on between them for 18 months. Now, during this time, the company phoned, regularly wrote, tried to influence her, and eventually they started to put pressure on her. Many of the things they called me, you couldn't print. And then they brought in a heavyweight. So in September 1961, they then bring two company officials from the company and a third man, Dr. Louis Lasagna. 
from John Hopkins. He was respected, outspoken advocate of controlled clinical trials, and he was there to help to push her over the line. This seems to be how things work. And I just recently highlighted what happened with um, Paxlovid. And you needed people in the background to ask hard questions and regulators to have wanted to look at the trial results from August 2022. Why, why would they have approved it, even emergency, when they could have had the trial results? There are so many questions that makes you realize that the regulatory responsibility clearly was not as is not as high as it should be. And certainly, possibly, if Kelsey was still around now, many of the things that we have done today wouldn't have gotten through. But I bring up the case of Lasagna because of this paper that he had done. So he was very well respected at the time. And he was working on this, um, the thalidomide. He was testing it, looking at it. It had been employed in Europe for several years as a sedative hypnotic they were testing it on rats. They used a big dose, 100 milligrams per kilogram, orally and injection in the peritoneum, and it didn't cause problems. So this lack of toxicity of large doses is most likely related to the insolubility of the compound and consequent limitation in absorption. So at the time, he was looking at how safe this drug was, and that suited the company very, very well. The problem was that they didn't think about it in the context of one specific group who could be at risk. This is where the, the question of greed comes. You know, what is remarkable about this story is that thalidomide would probably still be in use today and as a significant drug it's still used in leprosy and, uh, and a few other conditions, but it would probably have had a much broader reach if they had opted not to go down the line of pregnancy. As I said, maybe they didn't know that this could have been an issue, and thalidomide was a wake-up call for the industry, that pregnancy you need to be extremely careful about. But I can't think that this was the first time anybody thought about the fact that pregnancy needed to be treated in a very specific way. It's an unnecessary gamble. And so here is an important thought, and this is part of the, the issue. When we think about pregnancy, and there is very clear evidence that um, there is higher risk of hospitalization and sometimes mortality in pregnancy, but Based on certainly my research around ACE2, it's going to be in the high-risk pregnancies, older pregnancies, obesity, diabetes, hypertension in pregnancy. These are likely to be the conditions that had the highest risk. If you have a 20-year-old female who has no comorbidities, why in the world would you, would you take the risk? I, I genuinely cannot understand why people would do that. And in the same respect, when you have a very low risk cohort with regards to children, why would you take the risk? I mean, some people will say that there is still some benefit and it was worth the risk. I'm saying these are developing immune systems. We have no idea for five to 10 years what the outcomes of that is. And be very something. There is nobody who can tell you categorically that there are no issues because we don't have medium to long-term studies because we haven't reached medium to long-term. We had this occur with the swine flu vaccine and narcolepsy it took over a year and a half before they realized it. So we have no idea if we are not looking medium to long-term. That's where I say, that thalidomide, I think, was the lesson. But the lesson was corporate greed, not necessarily just about regulations. And if there is one thing that we're seeing now, corporate greed is still absolutely rife, where people will do anything 
to make more, where share prices are the driver for everything. And every corner, every opportunity must be exploited in order to make the most in the corporate world. My prediction is that this greed is going to be the demise of a certain technology. I think that if they had been safe and if they had been cautious and if they had used it in the high-risk cohort, who we knew what they were, without people who didn't already have infection, a limited group, I think that they would have been okay. But to use it in a way broadly across the population and not anticipate that this could be a problem, then that sounds like thalidomide again to me. And so therefore, I don't think we can say truly we can never again have them. I think that based on what I've seen, based on the research around autoimmunity, we have a problem. It is possible that nothing will happen. But I think that is the slim probability, not the fact that we are going to face many challenges, health challenges in the years to come. Hope you found that history lesson valuable and something to reflect on. Have a great evening.